the people of Sake actually brought me into Sake. Back in 1988, this place was actually in Ginza on the main drag. At first it was kind of soy sauce, it was miso. To the point where it actually changed my life. New Year's Day 1989. Uh, not just Sake as a beverage, but all the culture and history of Hello, everybody. Welcome to the latest edition of Sake on Air. I'm Christopher Pellegrini sitting in for Justin Potts. And the reason I'm sitting in the chair at the head of the table today is because I have a very special guest who happens to be essentially uh, my shochu twin, for lack of a better way to put it. Uh, all the way here from New York via Fukuoka is Stephen Lyman. Stephen Lyman is uh, one of the world's top, uh, probably one of the top two <laughs> non-Japanese shochu and awamori experts. And he has made a trip up here from Fukuoka in order to actually partake and, and uh, help out with a couple of shochu events and to uh, teach people about these things. We're going to hear a lot more about his educational efforts as well as his backstory in just a moment. But thank you, Stephen, for joining us. Welcome back to Tokyo. Thank you, Christopher. I appreciate the uh, invitation to be on the show. Uh, I am ashamed to admit I have not yet listened, although uh, some of my friends have been on, so I do plan to catch up on my, my booze-related podcasts soon. I think the listeners would really love to hear, of course, and a, a lot of people are aware of, of S Stephen Lyman. I'm sure a lot of people that are listening to us have found him on social media and seen his rather uh, amazing Instagram feed that features a lot of food, a lot of travel, a lot of drinks, of course. Um, can you tell us a little bit about you and like how, what brought you to where you are today? What's the origin story for Stephen Lyman? Uh, very good question. And it's going to take me a while to, to unpack that. Um, I was born in Buffalo, New York. My parents were both academics and my father, uh, when he graduated from medical school, we traveled a bit for his residency and then his internship. And then we ended up settling in Tampa, Florida. Uh, so I grew up down South. Um, people usually say I sound Canadian which is probably the buffalo in me, <laughs> um, since we were just across the, the falls. Sure. But um, I guess my first exposure to Japan was through, for a lot of people in my generation actually, was the miniseries Shogun with uh, Richard Chamberlain. And uh, I, I was fascinated that there was a, a, a country in the world that had grown up and become a civilized society with no Western influence at all. Mm -hmm. And even as a as like a ten year old watching that, I was just sort of fascinated by it, and all the the costumes and the sword play and everything was just you know right up right, my alley. Right. And this is back before cable television, so actually they'd rerun the miniseries every year. So I watched it like throughout my entire teen formative years. I'd watch it every year, and I sort of forgot about Japan after that. And like sushi wasn't really quite a thing in Florida at that time. I think the first time I had sushi was in college. Actually, mm -hmm. a Korean friend of mine introduced me to it. But actually, in college was my second exposure to Japan. I uh, was a political science major, and I took a course on comparative political economy. And we uh, ended up having to read seven textbooks, and we wrote essays on each textbook. Um, and the book that we read about the Japanese uh, government is called The Peasant Soul of Japan by a professor, Watanabe, from uh, Sophia University. Mm -hmm. And it's a fascinating view into why Japanese culture is the way that it is. Um, and that really made me you know, very impressed with Japanese culture, even though I'd never been here. So fast forward again, and I end up uh, moving to New York City uh, after grad school. Uh, got a job as a clinical epidemiologist, which I'll let people Google if they want to know what mm -hmm. that is, um, at, a, at a university hospital in New York. And I um, started realizing that there was more to Japanese food than, than sushi. Right. I discovered ramen, I discovered izakaya, that sort of thing. But I didn't really know that they were izakayas. I just thought they were Japanese restaurants that served more than sushi. Mm. Um, and I didn't discover shochu right away. But then uh, I guess I've been in New York for about five years when uh, I was out for dinner with friends. We had gone to a Spanish tapas restaurant. And it was a welcome party for this German guy who was moving to New York. And um, him being German after dinner, he wanted to drink more. And we were game, so but we didn't know the neighborhood, and mm -hmm. it was just an area that, of of the city we hadn't hadn't spent any time, and uh, it was next to this Japanese bar called Izakaya Ten. Right. And uh, we walked in and sat down. The place was almost empty. It was about ten o'clock at night on a Tuesday, and uh, the waitress came over and put the menus down and said, you know, it's 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 Tuesday, so it's half price on a bottle of shochu. And I said, what shochu? She said, it's like Jap Japanese vodka. Oh. Which is 
terrible, terrible description. <laughs> and I don't even like vodka. <laughs> but I looked over the, um, I looked over the, me- the menu, and I realized I could get a, a full 750 milliliter bottle for twenty two dollars. Which not, not a know. bad deal at all in a in a restaurant. Yeah, not not New York City. Yeah, no especially. Kidding. Yeah. So uh, ended up ordering a bottle. Uh, texted a buddy of mine who joined us, and and we, so we ended up finishing the bottle that night. Four people, and and uh, just ended up having a really nice time. And so the first shochu we ever had, or I ever had, was Ichiko, uh, which still has a soft spot in my heart as a nice vacuum distilled, uh, blended, hundred percent barley shochu. And at first, I was just content to keep going back to Izakaya Ten and trying the different shochus and getting my half price bottles every Tuesday. Uh, I think we calculated we we were there about 35 out of 52 weeks the first year. No kidding. Yeah, it was one one time there was a massive snowstorm. There was about eight to 12 inches of snow on the ground, and we were the only customers all night. So we just drank with the staff. Nice. Uh, it just had that really kind of homey feel at that time. And a little bit later, the High Line came in, and then all the art galleries moved in, and it just became this like fashion place. So it wasn't uh, yeah. it became much more hip and trendy. Right. Right. Um, and now it's actually been. Uh, changed ownership and it's it's called juban but it still it still captures the original feeling the menu is very similar they still have the discount on shochu uh, i actually helped them with their new shochu list oh yeah help them curate that. i was actually just there the last time i was in new york I was oh, there, you? I went to juban yeah oh cool yeah so i you know i got curious about shochu but when i googled things you know and i was a researcher so i was used to doing research and when i looked into shochu there's just nothing in english online I found one kind of dead website. It was called shochucircle.com, right. which was this uh, expat who was living in Japan. And when he when he left Japan, he stopped writing on his website. So I ended up just starting a blog. Like this late what, 2000, I guess the blog started in 2011. I discovered Shochu in 2007, so it was about four years of just drinking and enjoying. And mm-hmm. I started the blog, and then a couple of friends of mine who are uh, web, well, one web designer and one... Um, graphic designer ended up building me the website compi.us which uh, I just we turned the blog into essentially shochu reviews a little bit of information about izakaya uh, how to how to enjoy izakaya dining because it's just a different style of eating and then uh, but it really you know I'd re- at first I thought it was going to be food and drink and then it just became drink it just it, shochu was really what people were interested in because there wasn't any information right and from the website uh, started to get introduced to shochu makers and um, when they'd come to town and then I got to know some chefs and some bartenders. And it, so my re- I think my reputation started to grow through that. And actually in, in there, I, I didn't mention my first trip to Japan actually was in 2009. So a couple of years after I discovered shochu, but I was only in Tokyo and Osaka and mm-hmm. I didn't really go deep into shochu here, mm-hmm. uh, partly because I didn't speak the language at all at the time, but I, it was just a fascinating country. So anyway, back in New York, I started meeting the makers and that sort of thing in 2012 there was a shochu tasting contest in New York, which was uh, organized by uh, one of the local izakaya owners. But it was basically, I think, about 20 different izakayas around the city for about, I think it was about a two-week period. If you came in, you could compete in the contest. You would taste five shochu, and then you had to pick three of them blind on a retaste and, okay. and, and match them with the right bottle. Gotcha. And you had to do that twice. Okay. So you had to taste 10 shochu and match six of them. Okay. Um, and... There were about close to a thousand contestants who participated, and there were eight people who got perfect scores uh-huh. in the in the first round, and I was the only American. Everyone else was Japanese who got a perfect score. Um, and there's there's video evidence of me doing this because NHK was actually following me for round two for for no for the uh, for the competition. Oh, like, okay. Uh, they knew that there was this American shochu geek in New York that you know um, that they wanted to profile, and so. So I ended up making it to the finals, and it was at the uh, Kitano Hotel in, on uh, Park Avenue, on that, in their, their big banquet hall upstairs. And I was so nervous, and they had me mic'd up, right? Mm-hmm. I'm wearing like a lapel mic under my shirt or whatever. And I meet a few people there, and I, one of the people that I uh, bumped into was a sommelier at uh, N Japanese Brasserie, which is a really, really elegant Japanese restaurant in, in Tribeca. And... We had a welcome tasting as we were walking in, uh-huh. and they did about 30 or 40 minutes of introductions and entertainment before they did the first blind taste, and you had to remember which one it was that you had tasted coming in. <laughs> and the way they did it is they had four chairs. I think we, we tasted four, four shochus, 
and they had four chairs set up, A, B, C, and D, and you had to walk to the chair that you thought it was the shochu. And I was stuck between two of them, uh-huh. and I'm walking toward the one I was kind of leaning toward, but I realized that almost everybody else was moving to the other chair. <laughs> but then I looked at the chair that I was heading toward, and the, and the sommelier from N was there. Uh-huh. And I was like, well, she's got to know what she's, ta- what she's thinking, uh-huh. right? So I walk over to that chair, and I'm standing next to her. And I was like, did it taste like B or whatever it was? And she said, oh, I just didn't taste it. I just smelled it. I was like, well, I'm not going to walk across the room now to the other chair at the last <laughs> second. <laughs> so I ended up losing in the, in the first round, <laughs> which was really embarrassing. And I think not the result that NHK wanted. NHK was not looking for that. That's right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but then the guy who ended up winning is this Japanese guy from Fukuoka. Uh, oh, Seikai, Seikai, right? Seikai, Seikai yeah. Ishizuka. Uh, and he he's a jazz pianist who's lived in the States for since he was 18 and uh, really, really sweet guy. And I got to know him as a result of that. I interviewed him for the website as the winner of the, the contest. And he and I started uh, hanging out drinking. And he had won two round trip tickets to Japan. And I think $2,000 is his, his grand prize. It was right. a nice, nice deal. Yeah. And so when I just said, and he, because he was from Fukuoka, that's where he was going to come visit when he, uh, when he flew over. So I, said, if you, I said, if you don't mind, I'd love to just book a flight at the same time you're Tag going, along. and maybe we can hang out and go to some distilleries or something. Um, and he ended up booking a flight in July, so I went with him in July, not knowing that nobody's making shochu in July. Because mm-hmm. I, I still was a, a novice at all of this, right? I just liked to drink it, and I had a blog. Mm-hmm. I had opinions about how to drink it, but right. not anything else. So I got to see a bunch of idle distilleries. You know, they're all mm-hmm. on vacation because right, it's right. too damn hot, and you should have make, make booze at that time. <laughs> and so the... Um, but I ended up on that trip. Uh, originally, Seikai was just going to tour around Fukuoka with me and then go spend time with his family. But he was having so much fun. And he jumped on a Shinkansen with me and went down to Kagoshima, where he had a great time and saw a bunch of, of distilleries there as well. And uh, Komasa-san from Komasa Shuzo, he, uh, I'd met him in New York a couple of times. And he'd always been very appreciative of the work that I was doing. And I actually really, really like his shochus and uh, sweet potato. And... Um, so he and he he was very hospitable. He said, "So when when you come to visit, what do you want to do?" And he even hired a translator to to show me around oh, for, wow. for two days. So really really nice uh, experience. So Seikai came down with me and and we so w- sorry so with Komasa San I said he, he, I said I want to do two things. I want to go to your local izakaya. I don't want to go where you take clients. You know you try to wine and dine people. I want to go where you go to drink. So he takes me to this tatami matted. Miso Oden Izakaya. Smoky with, as all get with out. With old men chain smoking and drinking yeah. from Isha bin Oyuwadi in the middle of summer. Nice. And it was perfect. Yeah. Like the waitresses like would drop things and you know, dishes <laughs> clattering in the kitchen and it was just perfect old old Japan. Yeah. And then uh, the other thing I wanted to do is I said I wanted to see a traditional handmade shochu distillery. I knew that they existed, but none of those brands exist in the US at this point. There are very, very few. And uh, so he ended up taking me to Yamato Zakura uh, Distillery in Kagoshima. And again, it was there, it's not the production season, but the Toji, uh, Tekan Wakamatsu, was, was kind enough to show me around. And I got such a, such a sense of him being such a gentle spirit and so passionate about what he's doing. He was actually working in advertising in Tokyo yeah. when his father got sick and he needed to co- go home and run the family business. I mean, this guy was living the life here. Yeah. You know, big ad firm. He was DJing on weekends. He's just having, having the life. And he's, he's back in rural Kagoshima. Ichiki, yeah. Yeah, you know, with population around, I think, 7,000 people on the Ichiki side of Ichiki Kushikino. Right. And, uh, you know, courting his w- wife was a tough job because she wanted to live in a city. Uh, yeah, he <laughs> think, had to convince her to come back. That's uh, right. Yeah, I think for the first, the first two years of their uh, marriage, he lived in, in Kagoshima City. And he would wake up at like four in the morning to drive to the distillery to, to start working during the season Ugh. and then drive, drive home at, you know, midnight or something. It was just Crikey. a brutal, brutal schedule. Yeah. Uh, he finally convinced built, her, built her a very nice house. Yeah. And, and, and now, she was now willing to move out with her right. kids. Yeah. That's right. So now she lives, they, they live across the street from the distillery. But, um, with that experience, you know, I thought it would be my, like, I, I thought I'd come back to Kyushu periodically. I definitely wanted to come back for the production season to actually see shochu being made um, rather than empty distilleries. But uh, I thought it would just be an, maybe an annual or semi-annual pilgrimage that I'd you know, just come over every so often. Um, 
but when I got back to New York, I thought about it. I was like, no, you know, I want to learn how to make it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I asked Tekan if I could do an internship at Yamato Zukoda the next fall. And he, I think, I think I asked him around June or July and, and for, for the, the September to December uh, season. season. Yeah. And, and he said, okay, if you learn Japanese. All right. So I started Japanese lessons in August. And I was in the distillery in October, and I didn't speak any Japanese. <laughs> but he actually spoke better English than I had realized, because he didn't need to, because Akiko was there translating. Sure, sure, right? sure. So I had no sense of his ability to speak English. And then uh, he's also a huge Star Wars fan. So when, when, when we couldn't communicate through my very, very limited Japanese or his English, we would resort to Star Wars terminology. So there you go. He often still refers to me as Padawan. <laughs> Right, and that, that experience, that internship is a annual thing now, right? How That's long right. have you been there? I've now I've, I've been there for six brewing seasons uh, every year at Yamato Zakura. Um, we are, I've, I've, I've stayed for as long as a month. Um, I'm really, really hoping at some point in the near future to do the entire season. Um, I've got to figure out with my employer if that's ever going to be possible, but that's, that's one of my hopes. Um, he really needs the help. I mean, it's a sure. tiny, tiny distillery. S and Smallest distillery in Kagoshima, no? That's right, yeah. yeah. It's uh, 40,000 liters of shochu per year. a year, which is just a minuscule amount. It's tiny. Yeah, There's, there are producers that make many times more than that a day. A day, yeah. 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 So D Right across the street. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he does everything by hand. He actually calls it the sadistic system <laughs> because it's just back-breaking labor. It's brutal. Yeah. I lose weight every time I do it. You know, I and get yeah, fit. It's like my gym. There's a diet plan right there. Go work with Tekkan Wakamatsu for about a week. You yeah. will drop kilos. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, you will sweat it all out. It's impressive work. Yeah. It's not for everybody, but you manage through it six times, yeah. and you want to do a whole season. That's I do. I really do. Respect. It's, 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 you know, you, some people go to, like, yoga camps and things like that on their vacation. For me, sure. going there and working with my hands, because I'm paid to think, right? I'm, I'm a scientist. It's, it's all brain work. Mm -hmm. And to be able to do physical labor and have an end result that's a product as beautiful as that, that is people just, will line up for. Yeah, that's right. It's yeah. a it's a really really uh, for me very refreshing way of resetting my priorities and everything else. Yeah, and it's a phenomenal product. All of his all of his brands are phenomenal. They really are. Um, so now you're in you're in Fukuoka now. A lot of a lot of things going on for you right now. You got a mm -hmm. book coming out. I do. I do. So um, there was a book that came out a few years ago, 2011 actually. Right after the, right before the, right to, around that time of the, the, Tohoku, of the earthquake, yeah, yeah. Tohoku, the Tohoku disaster with the tsunami and everything. Um, but the book Drinking Japan by uh, Chris Bunting, another Christopher. There's uh, a lot of Christophers. <laughs> there yeah. are. But I'm, uh, yeah, oh, struggling to keep all of you straight. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so Chris Bunting, um, really lovely guy, but he he moved back to England actually shortly after the book came out and. I actually used it as a tr travel guide the first time I went to Kyushu because he, he recommended bars. And, and like half the bars that he recommended were closed. Yeah. And that's the thing is when a bar becomes famous, it's famous because it's been open for a long time in Japan. And then nobody wants to take it over when the owner retires. Right. So these amazing bars uh, just close. You know, and there's a place in the book called Shochu Tengoku. Right. Which I really, really wish still existed the first time I went. But I guess they closed like a year after. Th like basically between the book came out in 2000. 11 i was there in 2012 and it closed within that window i went i used the book as well and i tried to find i went all over the country looking for a lot of the places that he mentioned and they were there were tons of shuttered shops it was amazing yeah um so i had, i started communicating with him through social media somehow i think he gave me his email address through like a direct message on twitter and so i started communicating with him periodically bugging him to write another book mm -hmm. and he finally said well you know I've, I've actually moved back to england and i'm no longer you know, in Japan, it's not something I can really do. And I was living in New York at the time, but I was traveling here a lot. And he said, well, maybe we should write it together. Um, and so basically, it became a collaboration, which we had never met until the book was almost finished, actually. <laughs> um, he, so we just communicated through Skype and, and email and that sort of thing. But he basically shared all his original materials with me because he had done all of this extensive research about the history and that sort of thing. And he had access to fantastic translators here who helped him find a lot of that original work. And that's not something I could have done from New York. Sure. But then we, we repositioned the book. We actually first pitched it to, to Tuttle, the publisher, as 
as a, a second edition. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, nobody, it made sense. They said, well, there's two things wrong with that. One is anybody who has a first edition probably isn't going to buy the second. Sure. And the other thing is that people don't really use travel guides anymore. And he wrote it as a, as a travel guide in Japan for alcohol. Right. 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 And people just use their smartphones for everything. Sure. Right? All that information is available on your fingertips yeah. if you know where to look. And so we decided to reposition it as a drinks guide. Uh, so it's really about the alcohol traditions of Japan and their adaptation of Western alcohols. So mm -hmm. you have in the, what I'm calling the washu section or Japanese alcohol section is um, sake, shochu, awamori, and then uh, kajitsushu or, or the fruit umeshu. ferments. So yeah. umeshu and other, okay. other styles. Uh, and then in the yoshu section or foreign alcohol section, it's uh, whiskey, wine, beer, uh, and cocktails. Sure. Uh, and then a final chapter on where to buy it okay. worldwide, mm -hmm. online, retail, on-premise, off-premise, all nice. that sort of thing. And so it's, it's a it's a extensive rewrite. It's it's actually quite a bit more text. It's about 50% more text. Okay. Um, and I really took out a lot of the things that Christopher had originally written about traveling in Japan and about what, what the drinking culture is here mm -hmm. or what the expectations are of customers in bars here because that's not the point of the book. Sure. Right. And I, I focus much more on uh, history, production met methods, and the culture surrounding the different drinks, mm -hmm. uh, and and really try to flesh it out. So, it's it's a quite a bit quite a bit different book. Um, if you've it has read a different title too, right? It does. It's called the Complete Guide to Japanese Drinks, um, and it's now available pre-order on Amazon. It'll be released October first, twenty nineteen, which is World Sake Day, and I'm excited about it. It's my first book. Uh, hopefully not my last. Uh, Tuttle's asked me to do a, a travel guide to Kyushu uh, as my next book. Fantastic. Which, which doesn't exist. No. And there will be shochu in that book as well, I Fantastic. guarantee you. Fantastic. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it was a really interesting experience. Um, I'm glad that I could work with some original source material and have a co-author on this first book because I really, I w as a scientist, I've, I've done collaborative work my entire career, sure, like sure, working sure. with other writers. Uh -huh. As we as we write papers, I've never published a paper by myself in okay. an academic journal. Mm -hmm. So the, the thought of writing a, you know, a three three hundred page book, yeah, by myself, and, and you you know the the experience, right? It's, when, it's when you great fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Character building exercise. Yes, yes, Hit, and hitting deadlines. And I think that I think that's something that Tuttle actually appreciated with me is that as a scientist, I'm used to meeting deadlines. Right, right, right. Um, and so uh, I've I've only been you know a few days to a couple weeks late on anything, and I'm sure that that's not their experience with a lot of their. I'm sure it's writers. not writers. I'm sure it's not. <laughs> Well, that's fantastic. So October 1st, 2019, you hear, heard it here first. Uh, make sure to pre-order that uh, so that you can, well, certainly it helps, the, it helps the visibility of the book if it's being pre-ordered. That's right. Um, I have pre-ordered it myself. And, uh, in, you know, that's a very educational, you're an academic, that's an educational way of associating with these drinks. And another way that you're in education is you're, you're one of the main teachers for the Shochu Advisor course that's uh, kind of presided over by the Sake School of America. Um, right. can, you, can you tell us a little bit about that, and particularly any advice that you have for people who might want to take that course? Sure, sure. Um, so the uh, c certified shochu advisor course is, is essentially like a level one introduction to shochu. It's the only uh, English language course on shochu currently in existence. Right. Uh, and it's, I teach uh, the East Coast. Um, so depending on interest from students, I, I would go to Boston, New York, D.C., Chicago, um, or other cities. You know, uh, probably Miami and Atlanta are all cities we potentially could have it in. And then the West Coast is actually taught by Toshio Ueno, who's a master psalm. Right. He's a, a very, very well-respected uh, uh, expert in sake, shochu, and, and wine as well. Right, and we both studied under him in, in L.A. a few years ago. That's right. We yeah. were part of the first English language shochu advisor course taught by Toshio in Los Angeles in 2015. It, I think it was, yeah. And I was the first person to finish the test, so I was student number one. I actually finished I thought you. Than... I thought you got the first one because you got the highest score. Well, th that too. Oh. I did get the highest score, and I, I also cause finished Because I finished first. the test first, and I waited because I knew that one of the questions was wrong. So I waited so as not to interrupt. Ah, okay. And I said, this is wrong. And he looked at it. He's like, you're right. And, then it, <laughs> and that helped everybody. And then I was like, okay, all right, there you go. All right. Okay, so maybe I didn't finish first. Maybe I just had the you highest score. You got the highest score, score. Yeah. yeah. 
and, and you know, I was really the, re, the, the, sh the course had been on their website for years and it had never been taught because they never had enough students. They uh, needed, yeah, I think, right. a minimum of eight students to, to teach the class. And so I got you to fly in from Tokyo. Jesse Fallowitz flew Jesse in. Jesse flew in from, from New, New York. York. And, and a uh, couple other folks who were just kind of from around, bartenders. And, that's right. That's and then right. Brian Booth also took it. Brian, Brian Booth, Booth was in there. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that, so that was <laughs> the first. And, and that, at that time, you took, the, you took the course on a Monday, and then the exam was the following Monday. So you and I holed up in uh, we Nancy Kissam's house up on the hill. Oh, yeah, that's right. We were house sitting. That's, yeah, we, that's, we dog sat the, the pugs. We did. We did. They're beautiful little rescue dogs. Um, we were house sitting. That's right. Yeah, yeah. that was hilarious. I'd <laughs> walking those dogs around. So one of their beautiful little dogs is missing a, a limb. Yeah. And the, just the two of those dogs together had such different. And the, the one, the th the three legged dog always would sleep it in my room. Yeah. The other one slept in your room, yeah, right? That's right. And the three legged dog would kick me all that time, <laughs> all the time while I was sleeping because it would twitch, <laughs> and then like gut punch me or give me a nice liver shot. <laughs> my liver doesn't need any more abuse, <laughs> my friend. Get out of here. But yeah, that was, that was, and I, obviously, cat's out of the bag. Stephen is is a very dear friend of mine. For uh, we've been. Uh, friends for a while um the way we were kind of circling each other online for a, a couple of years um but uh, you want to you want to tell a little bit of the story about how we first met <laughs> or you do you care to reveal that <laughs> no, no I'll, I'll tell that story actually let, let me finish the, oh uh, sorry 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 the, sorry the, the show two advisor yeah, right. course okay um so it's it's a one-day course and uh now we actually give you the exam at the end of the course oh. uh, so you t it's a one-day one day That's process. Better. You don't have to wait a week right. to take the exam. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that you do is you taste about 15 to 18 shochu throughout the, throughout the day to start to understand all of the styles. Um, now, it's not, the, it's not the sommelier level course in which you'd actually be tested on uh, your ability to evaluate a product blind. Um, th in this course, the tasting is just for your own knowledge and, and enjoyment, um, but not so that you can, you can speak intelligently about the product and so that you don't ever call it japanese vodka that's right. basically <laughs> right. that's right um as far as advice for taking the course i right. mean one is sign up early because okay. the more the more people who sign up early the more likely the class will actually be taught okay right we've had to cancel a couple just because we haven't oh, no had kidding. enough students that's a bummer it is you know especially for the students who are wanting to take it yeah the other thing is read the book <laughs> they, they read mail, the textbook. That's yeah. right. They they mail you a book um, and read the book. The exam is based on the book. It's yeah. not what you're learning in the class. Yeah, not everything that you teach people is going to necessarily be on the test. That's so right. That's right. Just and I, get the basics from the textbook. That's right. Yeah. L l you know, and and so really read the book and then re take the review test. They give you a, a sample review test. That's that's very helpful as well. And you should be fine, right? Yeah. Yeah. That that's that would be my advice. It's. It's a lot of fun, and I enjoy teaching it, and I really do want to, like I said, update the text and, and start to make it, you know. A little, I think the text was written in the, uh, probably the early 2000s, so it's, re it's really due for a refresh. But yeah. it's, it's, it's worth, you know, shochu is an, is an ancient drink. It's not like it's changed a lot uh, in the intervening decade, but there are some updated materials that could be included. So, um, But that's the course. I'd, you know, if you're interested in taking it, contact the Sake School of America or uh, tweet at me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm at shochu underscore danji, D-A-N-J-I. And it's, so shochu, I hope everybody knows, S-H-O-C-H-U. Well, not everybody knows. That's that's right. that's, some of the spellings on menus here are mind warping. Yeah, so that's, um, that's the course. And then the, uh, yeah, so that's sort of an opportunity for me to use, use my educational background, my academic background, and teach shochu which has been a lot of fun. And uh, the good news is uh, uh, the World and, uh, sorry, Wine and Spirits Educational Trust out of the UK, WSET, is right. actually establishing a level three spirits course. And I believe that spirits course is start either later this year or next year. And it's going to And it will include shochu. Fantastic. Because it is a world spirit. Love it. Yeah. Love it, love it, love it. Thank you, WSET. Yes. Um, WSET here in Tokyo, uh, their classes are at Kaplan. Um, over kind of in between Gaia and Mae and Omote Sando stations on, on, on that. Uh, I can't remember the name of the road, but 
and they do the level three sake here in English. They do the level one sake here in English, which is uh, very, very popular. It would be great if they carried that spirits course mm -hmm. as well. If they do, I'll come up and take it with you yeah, for sure. Yeah. I, I would love to take that course. Yeah. And yet, yeah, so I did do my uh, Kiki Sake Shi, mm -hmm. uh, really in preparation for the book. I wanted to understand sake as well as, as Shochu. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, am, I did the, the level one certification and then I did the Kiki Sake Shi. And they, the, as an instructor for Saki School of America, they've asked me to take some of the higher level courses. I just haven't had found the time to, sure, sure. to take them. Yep. Especially if they're like multi-week type things. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. So yeah, I guess getting back to how you and I met. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we were circling each other on social media and you were very active on Twitter uh, at that time. And, it, and I was more active on Instagram. And in some ways we've sort of switched because I'm now more active on Twitter and I think yeah, you're I think more you're active right. on Instagram. Yeah. Like, I think I've made two Instagram stories in my life, and you seem to do them quite regularly. Um, and so I'm, and I've become very engaged on, on Twitter. Uh -huh. But on, you know, I, I, I followed you on Twitter, and we'd interact occasionally. And then you, you, you realized I was in Tokyo, and you reached out to me. And I was, I was, I have to be honest, I was a little bit hesitant. I know. <laughs> because at the time, you, your, your profile picture. <laughs> You, you look like Sean White, uh, yeah, I know. the uh, I did, the, I, the I snowboarder. Look like Sean White with the long, you the had, long locks. You had long locks and a bright yellow button down. No, I think it was it, a, it was a bright yellow, you know, kind of autumn vest. Oh, was one it one of those okay. puffy vests? Okay, <laughs> even better. Yeah, so I, I looked the part. So yeah. He, so in other words, you were judging the book by its cover, Stephen. I, I don't know. I, that's I don't I, know how I feel about that. I was, you know, I didn't know if I could be associated with somebody <laughs> somebody like this, um, and so. Uh, and and I actually my my I only was in Tokyo for a couple of days and I actually had other friends that I planned on on visiting with, but then as fate would have it, my favorite shochu bartender in New York happened to be in Tokyo at the same time, and she's from Tokyo and she's like I'll I'll show you around it's uh, Aya from Aya, shochu from and tapas. Sho Aya. Aya. Yeah. She gave me a whirlwind tour of shochu bars in in uh, that must have been amazing in Tokyo. It was, it was a great great night. And, and I had a 6.50 a.m. flight out of Haneda. <laughs> you on silly, a, silly man. On American Airlines. <laughs> and, and I told Aya this, and I, I, she said, don't worry, I'll just drink with you until you have to go to the airport. Because she was here on vacation, right? Okay. So at 3 in the morning, as we're walking to the next place, she gets in a taxi and it says, takes I'm off. tired, I'm going <laughs> home. And I'm like, it's 3 o'clock. And of course, I'm... I'm, I'm Half in the can. I'm, I'm not sober and so I I was like all right I'm just gonna go back to my hotel I'll set my alarm take a, take a nap and I, I put my phone across the room I made sure that the sound was on full volume and I put it across the room so I'd have to get out of bed and I, I had like the most annoying alarm I, I could put on the like phone the wah, wah, wah. Yeah, yeah. something like that mm -hmm. and I woke up the sun was out it was 7 30 40 minutes past your 40 departure time minutes past departure time and i remembered sleepwalking across the room to turn off the alarm and get getting back did you bed. you just yeah. you went straight back to bed yeah i had no sense of the fact that i was actually supposed to get up it was almost like a you dream. probably didn't even know where you were yeah yeah that's wild um so the upshot of all this that's right is <laughs> that <laughs> you finally reached out to sean white that's right <laughs> yes <laughs> i got to meet my favorite snowboarder <laughs> And uh, I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, so I get this. I'm I'm on my way home from work, and I get I get a Twitter something. Right, he's like, "Hey, I'm unexpectedly in in town for another night. Are you up? Are you down for a drink?" I'm like, "Yeah, absolutely." Get straight on the train, go back into town. Um, called up one of my favorite well, bar that I was going to quite often at the time, um, Tokuri, uh, which is in Shinjuku on the west side of the JR lines. And yeah, sat down in there, had some decent food, talked shochu. Mm -hmm. Turns out that Stephen and I are literally the same person, f just born in different places. Um, we're both well into baseball. We're both into making films. We're both like helpless shochu maniacs. And I'm sure there's a couple other details. We get confused for each other all the time. I mean, it's hilarious how many times I'm in Kagoshima, for example, and they're like, oh, hey, Steven. And I'm like, try again. And they're like, oh, sorry. Oh, you're Chris. I'm like, yep, yeah, thanks. And I think nope, sometimes the same, same thing, thing happens, happens to me. They always guess wrong. Yeah. 
<laughs> uh, maybe I should regrow my Sean White locks. Yeah, that might just help. To, just to, I need I need hair down to my shoulders again. I think, and wear that big yellow vest, and that'd be dead giveaway. Oh, there you go. I wonder if I still have that vest. Just become your uniform. Right. I gotta bust that thing out again. Well, you're always in a vest and tie. It seems like that's sort of your. That's true. That's my. That's okay. my get up. Um, any other, any other news or announcements that you'd like to tell us about? It could be anything shochu related. Uh, things you've noticed. Things you're excited about. Yeah. Well, so one exciting turn of events and completely unexpected, actually. So I moved to Fukuoka last September, and in December, <laughs> completely unexpectedly. Uh, became a uh, part owner in a shochu bar, right? a standing bar uh, called Yokoban, New York, or NY. Uh, it's actually a kakuuchi, which is a standing bar inside of a liquor store. There's a, there's a shop called New York Wines on Keaki Dori in uh, the Akasaka neighborhood of Fukuoka City. And in the back of the bar, uh, sorry, in the back of the liquor store, the, the wine shop is, a, is a now a standing shochu bar. Uh, we play old movies on the wall. Uh, and live music on Friday nights. And we're trying to give a New York feel for people uh, living, or for people in Fukuoka. But then also the, the bar is really intended to be an educational resource for tourists who are visiting. So our menu's in uh, English, Japanese, and Korean. And we um, really, and our, our bartender is bilingual. And he really, he's from Kagoshima. He knows Shochu very well, Yo Uchida. Uh, used to live in Kyoto, realized he was looking for another opportunity, and we, we poached him and brought him to Fukuoka. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's been fun. It's, uh, we've gotten really good press, actually. We were written up in the local edition of the Asahi Shimbun, which I believe is the second largest newspaper in Japan. And uh, then from that, we've ended up on, I think, three or four television programs. Yeah, they keep coming, programs. which is great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Chris is actually one of the other partners in the bar. Didn't know if he wanted that revealed or not. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, not a not a huge problem. Yeah. Uh, and as of March twenty first, the prefectural, the Fukuoka Prefectural Art Museum, reopened after extensive renovations. Like took a couple of years. It was a two year renovation. So, so that make an afternoon of that if you're in in uh, Fukuoka, go to the art museum and then walk up Keiaki Dori towards Tenjin, and you'll walk right past the. Right past the wine shop and the bar. That's right. We're open from, in. from uh, 1 p.m. daily. Uh, That's right. So, yeah, stop in and have a couple of drinks. Um, <clears throat> you can take bottles home as well. That's right. Uh, we sell the small bottles in the shop, and the big bottles are for pouring in the, sh in the shop. We have some shochu swag as well. We have some of the, the traditional aprons that the distillery workers wear. We have some uh, handmade shochu pottery from from Kyushu right and lots of uh, Kyushu drinking snacks as well and even Kyushu drinking games that's right yeah, yeah. we have uh, nanko and uh, hopefully there will be an established routine nanko tournament that's right um, if you've never heard of nanko before and you probably haven't unless you're from Kagoshima even pe some people from Kagoshima have never heard of it before yeah Dio had never Dio had never heard of nanko before yeah. if you've never heard of it nanko referring to how many um, go to the, go to Yokaban, New York, and ask Uryo Uchida to explain the game to you. So uh, and and I'm sure that you will have a a wild and highly enjoyable time. It's the simplest game in the world. It is, but you know, it's, it's highly addictive. But I think of you know, when comparing drinking games, I think of beer pong is kind of like checkers. Sure. And not even checkers. I mean, it's sort of bowling or something. I don't know what it is, but. Nanko is is almost like poker, because you're you actually have to read the other person and and there's there's uh, you got to remember their tendencies yeah, and there's tells and there's yeah there are certain else. tells yeah it's there's a really really fun a game. lot of bluffing that goes on that's it's a right. it's a fun little game and of course if you lose then you drink that's right pretty simple yeah doesn't get any easier than yeah. that yeah they do have a Nanko tournament at Shochu Street they do in, uh, yeah. in Kagoshima so. Like I mentioned earlier, that sake, World Sake Day is October 1st. So Shochu wanted its own day, so that's November 1st. Right. And down in Kagoshima, they don't do anything Shochu-related by half. They actually have a three-day uh, festival, Shochu, outdoor Shochu festival. And uh, one of the days, they crown Miss Shochu right. for the year. And then another day, they have the Nanko tournament. Mm -hmm. And uh, Christopher and I are always there yep. uh, for at least one or two or three days of that 
of that festival. Um, but yeah, Nanko is a lot of fun. Nanko is a great time. Yeah. Do you have any uh, anything that you're looking forward to, or anything that you've noticed in the industry recently, the show tour, the Awamori industry? Yeah. So this is an interesting podcast for me because normally I spend 75% of the time explaining what shochu is <laughs> and I'm assuming that sake and air has explained that before yes we do have a, a shochu 101 episode out okay great uh, so for those of you who haven't listened to that episode shochu is a traditional distir- distilled spirit from uh, mainly from Kyushu in southern Japan Fukuoka is essentially the capital of Kyushu uh, so it's my favorite city on earth i um, very happy to be living there um, but it's actually, it's made with koji just as sake is. So I'm sure your listeners are familiar with the koji yes, uh, they are. process, that sort of thing. But, and it can be made from anything, which is one of the fascinating things for me is that there's like 50 plus base ingredients that you can use and um, sweet potato by far the most interesting and, and diverse. Because uh, when they say 50 ingredients, one of those is sweet potato, but there's more than 50 varieties of sweet potato being yep. used. So uh, lots of complexity in the category. Uh, really love it. And obviously. Obviously. <laughs> Um, but I, I guess like a couple of interesting trends that I've I've seen uh, in the industry. W- one is this move toward vintages, mm. uh, right? So, so like especially Yachi Yoden has been doing really nice work where they're actually doing uh, vintage shochu. So they released the I think it was the 2017 Luther, right? And now they have the 2018 Mahler. And they call it the farmer's bottle. It's Why the do they call it the bottle. farmer's bottle? Because it's it's coming from a single field. They're using, uh, a, uh, so it's essentially an estate-grown uh, sweet potato that they're using. That they grow their own potatoes for, for that particular bottling. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know if they're up to full capacity growing their own potatoes, but I know that they grow a lot of the potatoes that they, they use in all are, of products. Those brothers are sadistic. They yeah. spend the full distilling season in the distillery, and then they spend the rest of the year taking care of those fields. That's right. Unbelievable. Yeah, very hard work. Yachi Oden is a great distillery with... Uh, a number of very, very tasty products. Mm-hmm. And yeah, if you can get your hands on those those seasonal ones. That's right. Yeah, so they're, they're, the vintage series that they're doing, the farmer's bottles, are, are very interesting. And then the other thing that they've done now, what are they, is it the Moon series? Yeah, yeah. right. That's, exactly. Those came out late last year, right? Yeah, and those are very interesting as well. Yeah. Um, and, and so what I, what, I think I, what I think I'm seeing as a trend, and I hope this catches on with other distilleries, is this move toward really embracing the terroir yes because it's shochu really is a terroir driven spirit which is really uncommon mm-hmm. um i mean other spirits can can claim terroir for sure like scott the scotch whiskies all have different profiles depending Absolutely. on where they're made sure um but shochu it, it's it's almost like you know like you're it's like wine like wineries you know mm-hmm. in the way that they specific potatoes grown in specific fields with certain amount of sunlight and rain and all that it all changes the product year over year for these small batches mm-hmm. Um, so I like the idea of starting to do vintages like that and really sort of farmers, you know, farm to bottle or whatever you want to call it. Single um, farm, whatever. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a really interesting uh, aspect. Um, the other thing that, as you know, uh, is, is, you know, over the last several years is Shinshu, which is yeah. the new shochu. So this is un, essentially unaged spirit. They're, they're bottling shortly after distillation, which gives you a lot of volatiles in the bottle. Um, so you get a lot of wild aromas and, and, and flavors. I have to be honest, I'm not the biggest fan of it, mm-hmm. but it is a trend. It's something that's interesting to try, I yep. think. And there are certainly people who look forward to it every year. You yeah. know, a lot of the shochu geeks here in Japan are like snatching up every shinshu from their favorite distillery that they can get. And they have big shinshu parties, a lot of the distilleries now, yep. which I think that is a relatively recent thing. That's right. And I, I've really only seen shinshu for... Um, Emo, you know, for sweet potato. And I think I suspect that that's partly because if you've tasted raw distillate from uh, atmospheric distilled rice, barley, or uh, kokuto, the brown, sh- brown or black sugar, they're, they're almost unrecognizable. The, the, the aging really, really mellows out those products to a much larger degree than with sweet potato. So I suspect that's why we haven't seen shinshu from the other styles. It could be. Although I did taste, when I was in Amami, Oshima, where they make kokuto shochu, uh, I did taste a shinshu there, and mm-hmm. it did not taste anything like sugar. You That's could not have guessed that sh- I've never sugar tried a kokuto sh- shinshu that I r- recall. Um, I've tried genshu, which yep. you're not supposed to try, or the, like straight off the still. Yeah. Right. Um, but 
that's interesting. I'll have to have to make that a priority the next time I'm down there. Yeah, it was one of I think one of the distillers. This was actually a, another Jetro sponsored event where uh, I was there with five Japanese sommelier and me, um, and we were giving tasting notes to the producers, to the suppliers, uh, to the to the distillers. And it's the first time they'd ever sat down and had a conversation with drinks experts about their products. I know it's amazing. And we were helping them develop the vocabulary right for their product. Yeah. And I was the only one giving notes in English. Right. And it was a fascinating experience. I bet it you know, was. And I had a relatively dim view of Kokuto. I just thought it was rum with koji added, which you don't need koji to make sure. alcohol from sugar. Right, right, right. Because uh, yeast has plenty of access to simple sugars already. Yeah. But I was fascinated with how deep and complex a category, a subcategory, I guess, that Kokuto shochu sure, is. Sure, sure, sure. And I just found, you know, there's, there's, there's one that was just completely lychee, that just smelled of lychee. And then another one would be like basically drinking a glass of molasses, you yeah. know, and Super, so much dessert yeah, diversity yeah, in, the, right. in it that I just wasn't aware of until I actually tasted through 35 of them over, over a couple of days. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and then I got to visit uh, a couple of the smallest uh, Kokuto distilleries mm -hmm. uh, in Amami and just really, really fascinating uh, ingredient to work with. And it's, it's, it's renewed my appreciation for rum, especially agricultural rum. Uh, which is a, a you know another sort of terroir driven uh, product like yeah. shochu. Uh, how do you, what's your preferred way to drink shochu and awamori of course? Uh, how do you do it at home? Yeah, so uh, really good question. I'm I'm a seasonal drinker, which means depending on the time of year, I tend to drink my shochu in different styles. Okay, uh, I mentioned earlier the the old men in the izakaya and drinking oyuwari shochu or hot water shochu in july in kagoshima which right. is insane um but they but do it so down there. good <laughs> you know i think japanese people have this sense that you should drink hot things when it's hot and i don't necessarily adhere to that i grew up in florida where there was lots of iced tea and and cold drinks all year long um so in the summer i tend to drink either uh on the rocks uh or mizuwari which is with cold water and ice or uh soda wadi or tansan wadi which is uh, mixed with uh sparkling water um on on ice so those, those dilute quite a bit you're almost to a beer strength when you do mizu wadi or uh tansan wadi but then in the winter i i do gravitate to, toward oyu wadi but it also depends on the brand uh there are some brands that become very bitter on the rocks and sure. those are much better oyu wadi yeah and there are some that like they they really shine with with soda. Mm -hmm. uh, Yamato Zakoda's Beni Imo, uh, purple sweet potato shochu. Yeah. It tastes like grape soda. That's amazing. When you mix it with soda. Yeah. It's, it's weird. Um, and then, so with Awamori, which we really haven't talked much about, that's, mm. that's a, an even more ancient distilling tradition from Okinawa. Sure. Only made with Thai rice, only made with black koji. Um, and, you, and it's a single fermentation, so it's an all koji fermentation. And you would expect it not to be as diverse because it's made with one ingredient, you know, one way. But still, there's a lot of variety. And what they're big into is aging. So kusu, or aged uh, awamori, is is just lush and deep and rich and delicious. And uh, the traditional way of drinking awamori is actually straight, like in little tiny thimbles. Uh, but it's pretty potent. Most awamori is 30% or higher. Uh, except, what's the island? Is it Yonag? Yonaguni. 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 Oh, and they make the, the fire stuff over it's was 65, 70 it percent. Yeah, it's not technically an awamori anymore. It's, That's right. Yeah. It's made in the same same uh, production process as I understand it. But right. it's, it's that, that stuff is too just, high legally yeah. to be called a yeah. awamori. You can you can probably fly an airplane with that. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, but so that's a traditional way of drinking awamori. But I when I visited Miyak Miyakojima, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of the islands in Okinawa, which is really really beautiful, famous for scuba diving and that sort of thing. Um, they, almost everybody drinks it mizuwadi. So uh, I, I was expecting people to be drinking it on the rocks since it's hot in Okinawa, it's tropical. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually mizuwadi was very popular for, uh, in Miyakojima yeah. for uh, yeah. awamori. So I, having, having learned that from the awamori makers that I visited when I was there, I've always gravitated toward uh, mizuwadi for my awamori. However, recently I've started drinking it oyuwadi. Yeah. And that's delicious. Now I want to drink some awamori. Yeah, we should do that. I think we should. <laughs> so as you've spent so much time in, in New York and around the States, around the world for that matter, uh, and shochu and awamori are certainly attempting, 
uh, from a number of angles to make a trip overseas. What do you see as the relative strengths and weaknesses of these products when being presented to a non-Japanese audience? Really good question. I think um, Shochu faces a number of challenges. I think the Shochu makers are aware uh, of these challenges. Some of them are self-inflicted, others are not. Uh, probably the biggest one, at least in the States, is, and I think this is probably true to some degree in Europe, is conflation with Korean soju. And the only relation that these two alcohols have is that their name means the same thing in their respective languages, and they're both booze. And they're both generally clear. That's right. Yeah, there's very, very little in common other than that. Korean soju is predominantly uh, multiply distilled like a vodka and then diluted back down to a survivable alcohol percentage and then with adding uh, usually uh, citric acid and, and other flavorings, sweeteners, that sort of thing. And with Hongkaku Shochu, which is all you and I drink, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's single distilled and you can't add anything uh, to, the, to the distillate except for water and time. Uh, and so you can age it, but you can't add any flavors or anything like mm -hmm. that. So very, very different products. And so what happened was some savvy Koreans lobbied the state of California to allow hard spirits to be sold on a soft liquor license. A soft liquor license is a beer and wine license. It's a fermented beverage license to sell distilled alcohol if it was 24% alcohol or less. And they, they got the law passed. And then the Japanese shochu makers reduced their alcohol percent by 1%. So there's lots of 24% alcohol shochu in the U.S. market. There's none in Japan. Right. And the other little trick is it has to have the word soju on the label, S-O-J-U. So you have honkaku shochu, soju. Right. And both of those phrases will be on the label usually. That's right. Some add insult to injury by actually putting the word soju on the label more than once. Yes. Which is annoying. Um, but because of this, the American consumers outside of California are stuck with the same label. And when you, when I was first doing like tastings and, and happy hours and things in New York to try to evangelize for shochu, I would ask people, have you ever tried shochu before? And they'd say, oh yeah, it was, I had it at karaoke. It's a little green bottle, right? I had a uh. terrific hangover the next day. Or they had a Korean barbecue. I yep. said, no, 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 no. That's no. not the thing. Um, so the shochu makers, if they had just stuck to what shochu was and ignored California, which is hard to do because it's what it's, the yeah. world's seventh largest economy or something, mm -hmm. um, they could have continued to make shochu shochu. And people still would have confused the two because they're both Asian spirits and they sound similar. Um, so... That was a little bit self-inflicted because the shochu makers made the decision to put soju on the label, but they were also sort of forced by stupid laws in, in California. If you're listening from California, please change that law if you have any control. There is, there is legislation that has been in the works forever. Um, I heard from Jetro in, in Miyazaki, actually. They, they showed, the, showed me the text of it, and it's stalled. Okay. Um, they need to push that through. Yeah. Another challenge is that a 20... 425% spirit is an awkward alcohol percent for, for Westerners, right? We're used to beer and wine strength, maybe sake strength, alcohol that we're going to pair with food. And then we're used to high proof spirits that are going into cocktails. Or you're going to sip a glass of whiskey or scotch or something after dinner. That's right. And you know, and then you have your digestifs or your aperitifs, right? So you have a few liqueurs and that sort of thing that people might indulge in. But 25% is just kind of a weird number. So, but once you explain to people that once you dilute it, you're down to a wine strength or even a beer strength, uh, if you do it, you know, once your ice melts a little bit or once you've added a little cold water, a little hot water, um, which I think is then becomes one of the strengths is it's, it's a food friendly spirit. And that's how I actually got interested in this was I, I was a big foodie. I still am. I love, love food. My Instagram can attest to yeah. that. Um, and I was fascinated with, with wine pairings, mm -hmm. uh, especially at, like I was so deep into Italian red wine before I walked into that izakaya um, that I was contemplating a trip to Italy, Italy for like a wine tour. That's you wild. Know, turned into a shochu tour That's you know, wild. a couple of years later. And I has, still haven't been to Italy just to visit wineries. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> well, it's something I'd like to do. Um, but so I think, 
and the thing, but the thing with like beer or wine pairings with food is that you know they're they have residual sugars, they're high calorie, they're heavy, mm -hmm. right? They have a lot of body to them, and so that you, you get full faster mm -hmm. when you're drinking those alcohols with your meal. And because shochu is a distilled alcohol with no no residual sugars, no added sugars, uh, and and really really diverse flavor and aroma characteristics, that you can pair shochu with virtually anything. Yeah, and that I think is a real strength for it. And y you had asked about trends earlier. One thing that I have seen pick up recently is what I would call high proof shochu. Mm -hmm. So I'd say anything over about 30, 35 percent alcohol would be, I'd consider high proof because it's higher than they sell it here. Sure. A lot of um, kokuto shochu and awamori is still at 30 percent. So mm -hmm. I would say probably 35 is a good number for high proof. Yeah. Um, and shochu legally can't go above 45. So it's that range of 35 to 45 percent alcohol shochus, which I think is much more appealing to bartenders to start using as a cocktail base because yeah, it'll definitely. start it'll start showing through uh, in the cocktail. Right. And uh, for any bartenders that are listening, listening, please, please, please make an iconic emo shochu. Cocktail. Yeah, just just experiment with emo. Make the make the and name it after yourself, whatever. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Just make the emo shochu cocktail. I thought we were going to call it the Lyman Pellegrini. The LP? <laughs> That's right. I like it. I'll take, a, I'll take an LP right now. Yeah, uh, but uh, I've had a few different emo shochu cocktails that uh, some of the mixologists in New York have, have been experimenting with. And they always put so many other things in it that it just disappears again. You, do, you don't taste or smell the emo. And th right. that's what's so lovely about it. That's what makes emo shochu, the, you know, the king of shochu, is that it just, it's got such great aromas. And, and yet all of that disappears. When you put 10 other ingredients exactly. in it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, so I think that's a, that's, that, again, is one of the potential strengths is as these high-proof shochu start re reaching export markets, mm -hmm. I think that's going to uh, probably drive interest and understanding of the category. You know, shochu has, you know, I think potentially a lot of appeal just as a, like I said, terroir craft, you know, artisanal uh, spirit. And it's, it's just such an outstanding category. I call it the, the beer of spirits because there's so much diversity in, you know, between the 50 different base ingredients, all the production methods, what kind of still you use, how you, how you mature it. Three different types of koji, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean. yeah. White, white, black, and yellow koji. And then you've got your, your koji fermenting fermentation temperature matters. Yeah. So your, many choices yeah. that you can. How long you let your ferment run for, how right. long you let the still run for. Right. How hot you make the still. Um, one of my favorite distilleries is Yanagita okay. down in Miyazaki. Yeah. And he's an engineer. And he actually, he's, he, I believe if, if he was a little bit younger, I think he was my grandfather reincarnated. Because <laughs> he almost looks like a Japanese version of, of, of Hank Baker. <laughs> um, and my, my grandfather was an engineer. And this guy has, he, when he took over his father's company, he he basically redesigned the whole thing to be as efficient as possible. Uh -huh. So there is no wasted movement by any of the distillery staff to do any of the work in the distillery. Everything is lined up perfectly, right? Mm -hmm. And he has all the right safety mechanisms and everything in place. And But one of the really cool things that he did is he uh, he redesigned his still so that he can act, he has directional jets for the steam inside the still. And so he can make a barley shochu that just a regular steamed barley shochu tastes like a roasted barley yeah, shochu. Yeah, it's amazing. By how he directs his steam inside his it's still. It's crazy. Right? It doesn't make any sense it, at all. <laughs> it doesn't. But he's essentially caramelizing the sugars in the ferment against the wall of the still it's to genius. create a yeah. roasted flavor. Ah, that's that's such a good barley shochu. It's too. really good. That's aokage. Aokage is immortal. <laughs> yeah, it's a fantastic, fantastic yeah. shochu. Um, but so all of these d different considerations, I mean, once you start to explore it, it's such a deep and broad category that it's, there's just endless possibility. If you become a connoisseur, you just, you know. Um, well, you, you, fantastic run through uh, a number of different shochu related areas. Uh, basically, for everybody listening at home, you should, first of all, pre-order the book. Um, what's the title again? Uh, the Complete Guide to Japanese Drinks. Okay. And it has a subtitle that I actually don't remember. Yeah. It's by Stephen Lyman and Chris Bunting. So he's, uh, he's still an author on the book. Uh, he wrote the foreword uh, and, as I said, shared his original source material. And then I basically did the heavy lifting on this edition since he's back in England. Um, it's not even an edition, right? It's, the, it's a, no, it's it's a, a brand, totally new book. Brand new book. Yeah. 
That's right. And uh, yeah, and I would also say check out kampai.us. Absolutely. Lots of shochu reviews and information about it on there. I promise new content coming soon. It's right now not mobile friendly. It will be mobile friendly very, very shortly. That's uh, why, with we, lots that's why of we're new, talking with Ian. Yeah. That's right. Lots of new content coming coming soon. Uh, and then at, again, social media. Oh, yeah. yeah let's, hear, let's hear those. Uh, Twitter and Instagram is at shochu underscore danji, D-A-N-J-I. Uh, danji actually means stubborn m- man in yeah. Kyushu dialect. And so I'm, a st- I'm stubborn for shochu. So I'm, stubborn I'm shochu. shochu danji. Uncle. And, uh, and also, if you are interested in the Sake School of America course, uh, please right. go online, find a date that works for you, and register. And if it's on the East Coast, there's a very good chance I'll be your instructor. Yeah, and if you want the course to come closer to you, then definitely hit up the SSA. They, uh, they, you, know, you can email them and make requests, and they will definitely consider that, especially if you have a, a group of people who you think might want to do the course together. That's so, right. Yeah. That actually happened in Seattle recently. Uh, one of the uh, well-regarded sushi restaurants actually wanted to do a staff training, so they actually brought Toshio to Seattle and had all of their wait staff uh, as well as other people in Seattle, yep. come in. They did t- they did two consecutive days. They did sake certification one day and showed you the Fantastic. next. Fantastic. I would say Atlanta is ripe for the pickings there as well. And well, thank you very much for joining us on Sake on Air. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. This 100%. Was a lot of fun. My pleasure. Very fun to talk with you on the mic for the first time. I think this, this is, is our first time. time. That's yeah. right. We've talked on camera before, but that's never right. on mic. Uh, I'd like to also extend a very Uh, heartfelt thank you to the uh, JSS, the Japan Sake and Shochu Makers Association, uh, whose offices we are recording from right now, and we always record from. If you haven't been to the JSS here in Tokyo, it's near Toranomon Station and a number of other uh, close-by train stations. You could walk here from Shinbashi probably. And they have a very, very affordable, educational, well worth a couple hours of your time tasting room on the first floor. You can taste through a number of sake, a number of shochu and awamori, lots of good literature in a few different languages down there for for people who are just getting into these categories, so please stop by. Uh, You can catch uh, Sake on Air by that handle on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Uh, Once again, I'm your host, Christopher Pellegrini, signing off from the JSS, and we will be back at you very soon. Thank you for listening.